Welcome to this episode. Welcome Rehab. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to have you with us. So let's get straight to it. Mm-hmm. Um there's been a lot of talk about data privacy in the last few years and it has really started to heat up on the continent and in Kenya as we've become more and more digitally connected. What exactly is the purpose of the Data Protection Act and what necessitated the need for it? Okay. Um so um with the evolution of technologies and um the adoption of ICTs um the rate at which we exchange information has significantly increased. Um, you cannot compare the amount of information that's currently being exchanged today with the amount of information that was being exchanged before the introduction of the internet. Mm. So with that in mind, um, there was need for us to have a framework and more so a legal framework that would regulate how information is shared, that would regulate in terms of um, ensuring that um, the people who are requiring this information have specific obligations that they have to comply with. So I am certain that if I give my information to any entity, they have a responsibility to protect it. Mm. If any information is being collected about me, I am informed that information about me is being collected and I also get to know what that information is going to be used for. Mm. So in essence, what um, the Data Protection Act is does is that it gives back the freedom and the right to privacy to the individuals at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. I get to have a say on my information, what is being done on my information, who my information is going to be shared with, and also at the end of the day, in instances where I'm not comfortable giving out my information, then I have a right to say no. At the mm. end of the day, what it does, it helps in actualizing your right to privacy, mm. which is a right that is guaranteed under the Constitution of Kenya. What type of data does the Data Protection Act apply to? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the Data Protection Act deals with uh, personal information and how personal information has been defined under the Data Protection Act is any information that has the capability of identifying you mm-hmm. as an individual mm-hmm. or identifies you. So that gives us two categories of information. Um, from the onset, if you give me your ID, mm-hmm. I'd be able to identify you. I'd know who you are. Mm-hmm. I'd get to know your ID number. I'd get to know where you were born. Mm-hmm. I'd also get to know your date of birth. Mm-hmm. But there's information that um, in a traditional sense might not look like personal information but it has the capability of identifying you something like your ip address um if you give me your ip address i'd have to figure out first what information that is but if you give your ip address to an it practitioner Mm -hmm. this person would be able to break it down to the point whereby they tell you fiona you accessed the internet at this specific place Mm -hmm. at this specific time Mm -hmm. at this specific date and this is what you searched well, for on the internet. Yeah. You see, yeah. in essence, that is not um, information that uh, has can identify you from the onset. Mm-hmm. I'd have to apply specific parameters to be able to actually identify you, but it still falls under the category of personal data. Something like your thumbprint. Mm-hmm. I'd need yeah. to have the equipment necessary to be able to actually link this thumbprint to you. Mm-hmm. But once I have that equipment in place, mm-hmm. then you see, I'm still dealing with your personal data. Yeah. So any information that has a capability to identify you as an individual, as a human being at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. is actually covered and protected under the Data Protection Act. So it covers, you know, some of the obvious things like name, date of birth, um, marital status, Mm -hmm. your health status, Mm -hmm. financial information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it covers all that information. Okay, okay. And what about like... uh, imagery is mm-hmm. that also like your photo of you your yeah. likeness yes yes that- the likeness of you any representation of you um mm-hmm. whatever you post on social media mm-hmm. is all covered under the data protection act mm. okay okay wow all right um so before we get now into the really you know the details of the data protection act mm-hmm. um maybe you can tell us a bit about like what is the office of the data protection commission um about and what is its role mm-hmm. in uh enforcing the Data Protection Act. Okay. So um, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner is established under the Data Protection Act. So the act was passed into law in November 2019. Mm-hmm. And then we had the Data Commissioner, who's the head of the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, being appointed in 2020, in November 2020. So I can say November is our lucky month. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so the office is established as a regulator. Okay. And the office has a responsibility or the mandate to ensure that 
anybody who's processing personal data within our ecosystem mm -hmm. does so in compliance with or in accordance to what is provided for under the Data Protection Act. Mm -hmm. So in terms of responsibilities, um, they, they vary and they're wide. Mm -hmm. So there's a responsibility to register data controllers and data processors. Mm -hmm. Also, we have the mandate to raise awareness on matters data protection. Mm -hmm. So this is to help individuals appreciate their right to privacy mm -hmm. and how they can go about in actually enforcing their right to data protection. We also have the responsibility of ensuring entities that process personal data or entities that deal with personal data mm -hmm. are actually complying with the provisions of the act mm -hmm. or the provisions of what the data protection provides yeah. um, of what the act provides for mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. this uh, office is the go-to place for all things data privacy data protection um, whether it's enforcement or any queries or complaints the office of the data protection commissioner is the place yes to go. Yeah. yes it is yeah mm -hmm. okay okay now, in the Data Protection Act, mm -hmm. um, there are several stakeholders that are mentioned. Um, we have data subjects, data controllers, data processors, and data protection officers. Could you break down you know, exactly who these stakeholders are, mm -hmm. um, define them for us, mm -hmm. their roles and obligations as well? Okay. Yeah. So I'll start with um, the common one. Um, we have the data subject. So the data subject is the individual, that's you mm -hmm. and me mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. These are the individuals who are entitled to the right to privacy mm -hmm. and to enjoy the right to data protection. So um, a data subject can only be an individual, a human being. Okay. Um, a common question that we get um, in the office is, a company is entitled to the right to data protection. A companies are uh, are um, maybe partnerships entitled to this right to privacy and data protection. Mm -hmm. um, they are not, mm -hmm. and the reason why they are not is because at the end of the day, the individuals behind the companies are the individuals who are entitled to the right to mm -hmm. data protection. Mm -hmm. So it's a right that will only accrue to a human being okay. and not um, cre legal creations of the law companies, partnerships, and sole proprietorships. Okay. So a data subject is the individual, the human being, who's entitled to this right mm -hmm. uh, of privacy at the end of the day. Okay. And yeah. then um, we have um, data controllers and data processors. So these now are the entities that need this personal information. Mm -hmm. you are, uh, for a good example would be your employer. In order for your employer to actually offer you employment, mm -hmm. they would need to find out information about you. Mm -hmm. Your name, they would need your educational background, qualifications, mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, for them to see whether you're best suited for this role or not. Mm -hmm. And if in instances where they actually extend the offer and give you employment, mm -hmm. then um, for them to be able to process your payments, your salary, your entitlements, mm -hmm. any allowances mm -hmm. that accrue um, due to your employment, they would ask for specific information. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in that regard, um, your employer becomes a data controller because mm -hmm. they need to process this personal information. Mm -hmm. um, and then a data processor, um, can do what a data controller does, but they'd have to work under the instructions mm -hmm. of the data controller. Okay. Okay. So the key distinction here between a data processor and a data controller is the data controller is the decision maker. The data processor implements the decisions mm -hmm. of the data controller. Mm -hmm. So um, an example that maybe can capture uh, this specific situation is in, in our Kenyan context, um, it's quite common for you um, whenever you're entering any building, you'll notice there's an Ascari mm -hmm. at the entrance. Mm -hmm. um, most of these Ascaris are usually linked to a private security company. Mm -hmm. So the requirement is um, under the law, um, there's a law that requires anybody who operates a publicly accessible area should have a security guard situated at the entrance of that building mm -hmm. and this security guard has a specific responsibility to record the people who are coming into that specific premises mm -hmm. and what they're coming in to do. Mm -hmm. So in that, um, in essence, so that relationship would have the landlord being the data controller. Mm -hmm. He okay. owns the premises okay. and he engages the services of a security company. Mm -hmm. The security company is the data processor. So mm -hmm. the security company will work under the instructions of the landlord. Mm -hmm. So the landlord would dictate to the security company, I need you to provide security services. In terms of collecting personal data, this is what you're required to collect. Mm -hmm. So the security company would be answerable to the landlord of that specific building. Mm -hmm. Now we have the relationship of the data controller and the data processor, mm -hmm. with the landlord being the data controller and the security company being the data processor. Um, are there instances where an entity can be both. 
yes there are instances where an entity can be both mm -hmm. so assuming let's say you you operate your own security company mm -hmm. um you'd see there's the traditional aspect of the service that you're providing security mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. and for you to provide those security services landlords would be engaging you Mm -hmm. So where a landlord, where you're reporting to a specific landlord mm -hmm. in that in that processing uh, activity, mm -hmm. you are the data processor. The landlord is the data controller. Mm -hmm. However, you still need to engage staff for mm -hmm. you to be able to provide services. Right. So you see, in your capacity of you engaging this specific staff, mm -hmm. then you become the data controller because mm -hmm. you're not working under the instructions of someone else. Mm -hmm. You are able to ascertain. I need maybe to hire twenty or maybe let's say 200 guards mm -hmm. because um, of the jobs that you've gotten. Mm -hmm. So you'll engage those um, specific guards in your capacity mm -hmm. as a data controller. Mm -hmm. Another scenario that comes to mind, mm -hmm. um, you know, just thinking about the context of, you know, this uh, podcast, mm -hmm. um, you know, let's say a marketing agency, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, uh, as marketers, we, you know, work on behalf of brands mm -hmm. to run marketing campaigns. And sometimes we will use certain platforms to um, run campaigns. So we have the agency who are working on behalf of a brand and they're executing a campaign on a platform, on a, you know, a system to execute the campaign. Mm -hmm. In that scenario, who's the controller, who's the processor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in such a situation, uh, situation where you've been engaged by let's say let's speak a company company x mm -hmm. they are bringing in a new product into the market they need you to make um create awareness around it mm -hmm. raise this is what it's offering yeah um so in in such a situation then the company that has engaged you this company x mm -hmm. would be the data controller and you as the marketer mm -hmm. would be the data processor because mm -hmm. everything that you do mm -hmm. you do under the instructions mm -hmm. of this specific company okay. that has engaged you got it yeah okay yeah. okay so so long as you're answerable in that processing operation mm -hmm. so long as you're answerable to someone else mm -hmm. to another entity to another organization mm -hmm. or to another institution mm -hmm. then you become the data processor mm -hmm. this entity that you're answerable to mm -hmm. becomes the data controller okay yeah. okay and it's on a case by case basis yeah like it is it is on a case by case basis mm -hmm. yeah and different scenarios call for you to be a controller at some point or a processor at some point yes what about the data protection officers so the data protection officer is a role that has been created under the data protection act mm -hmm. so it not not only is um, is it applicable in kenya mm -hmm. it's it's a new role it's a new function that we are seeing coming up mm -hmm. within this ecosystem okay um it's also provided for under the um, gdpr mm -hmm. which applies to the european union mm -hmm. so the responsibilities that have been given to this specific individual um is that organization can choose to hire a data protection officer mm -hmm. and this data protection officer would come in and assess the levels of compliance and assist the organization in terms of complying with the requirements of the Data Protection Act. Mm -hmm. And um, the uniqueness in this specific role is that data protection, um, we've seen a rise of, um, in terms of an enactment of data protection laws globally. Mm -hmm. I think it started off in 20, 2016 mm -hmm. when the EU um, went in to amend their, um, their data protection law for mm -hmm. them to come up with a GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, so based because of the amount of information that was being exchanged, mm -hmm. the amount of information that was being processed by organizations, mm -hmm. there was a need for this specific rule mm -hmm. to make sure entities that are complying. Yeah. Um, so the officer comes in, mm -hmm. uh, assists you or carries out an assessment mm -hmm. to f figure out where you are in terms of your compliance requirements mm -hmm. and then would advise you mm -hmm. on what you need to do to comply. Mm -hmm. So how the rule has been set up for our um, Kenyan jurisdiction mm -hmm. is that um, it's not mandatory for all, all organizations to have a data protection officer. Okay. You may choose to have one, mm -hmm. you may choose not to have one. If you have the resources, mm -hmm. well and good, um, they will come in and assist you mm -hmm. and make sure that you're complying. Yeah. If you don't have the resources, so that means if you cannot onboard this officer permanently within your organization, mm -hmm. there's a prospect of you outsourcing the specific services. Mm -hmm. So we have organizations that have been set up or um, uh, companies that have come into the ecosystem that provide data protection mm -hmm. uh, officer services to organizations. Okay. However, it's very important for entities to note that mm -hmm. um, non-compliance mm -hmm 
um, or the consequences consequences of non-compliance will not rest on the data protection officer. Mm. The persons who will be held responsible mm -hmm. are the decision makers of the specific organizations at the end of the day. Okay. So if the highest decision making entity is the CEO, mm -hmm. the CEO will be held responsible for non-compliance. Right. If the highest um, decision making entity is the board, then the board of directors mm -hmm. will be held responsible for non-compliance. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because um, I know, you know, not everyone can have a full-time DPO mm -hmm. um, on staff yeah. so you know it's good to know that it's not mandated that you have to have one but it's important to engage one to at least ensure that they can do the assessment and make sure that you're taking the steps to compl compliance yes yes okay yeah. one of the requirements of the DPA is that organizations should register themselves as controllers or processors um, what is the purpose of this um, and also how practical is it you know given you know every almost every business is a data controller and processor, mm -hmm. um, and is there a threshold for who applies? Because you know businesses are of different sizes; they are large, they are small, um, and so on. So maybe just paint that picture for us: who, what's the purpose of registration, mm -hmm. and who does it apply? Okay. Um, so registration is provided for under the Act, and. Um, the requirement under the Act is that anybody who's operating as a data controller or a data processor needs to register with the office. Mm -hmm. um, um, the purpose behind this is it forces organizations to go back and look into their processing operations. Mm -hmm. So what the registration process does, it's, um, it's, it's an assessment of um, where you are in terms of complying with the Data Protection Act. Mm. Um, so it will help you appreciate the volume of information that you hold and also ascertain the sensitivity of information that you hold. Mm. You might be thinking, um, I'm a small business enterprise, I do not deal with a lot of individuals, mm -hmm. but from the registration process, the assessment that will come out would be that you actually, you may be a small organization, but the type of information that you hold is quite sensitive. So for example, I could be uh, operating an NGO mm -hmm. And my NGO is focused on providing services to people, let's say, who've suffered um, maybe sexual assault mm -hmm. or even um, gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. I could even be dealing with people who um, are infected with HIV. Mm -hmm. You see, um, you could be dealing, let's say, with a group of about 100 individuals, but the information that you hold about them is quite sensitive. Yeah, it's very sensitive, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you see, you would need to have measures in place to ensure that you protect that information mm. so that these individuals are not compromised at the end of the day in the yeah. event that God um, forbid, maybe let's say um, this information leaked out. Mm -hmm. You see, these people could be prejudiced to discrimination based on their health status. Yeah. And that's what we are trying to avoid at the end of the day. Mm. So what the registration process does, it um, calls you to look into the type of information that you process mm -hmm. and also what you process this information for. Mm -hmm. You might find that you're processing maybe financial information and you don't need to be processing that financial information. Mm -hmm. So you see, um, you'll do away with that specific processing activity and the consequence of that is you reduce the risks that you could face as an organization. Yeah. So um, in terms of um, how to go about uh, registering, mm -hmm. so we've automated, the office has automated the registration process. Mm -hmm. It's done online. Okay. All you need to do is just log on to our website mm -hmm. www.odpc.go.ke mm -hmm. you should be able to see a tab that says register mm -hmm. either as a data controller or a data processor mm -hmm. so you log on to the system you create an account mm -hmm. and then after you create that account there's specific information that you'll be asked for mm -hmm. um, you'll be asked to provide all the processing activities that you undertake as an institution you could provide as many as a thousand more, mm -hmm. there's no limit mm -hmm. to what you can provide. Mm -hmm. You'll also be asked to provide um, the categories of sensitive personal data mm -hmm. that you process. So mm -hmm. there's usually a drop down menu. Mm -hmm. You get to pick all the sensitive personal data that you process. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be required to identify whether you transfer personal data to any country outside mm -hmm. of Kenya. Yeah. If you do, you just list the country. Mm -hmm. And then also you'll be required to provide a list of all the safeguards that you put in place mm -hmm. to protect the personal data that you actually handle. And then from there, you'll also be required to provide information based on the number of employees that you have mm -hmm. and also your annual turnover. Mm -hmm. So the reason why you need to provide this information is that it's used to carry out an assessment to find out how much you should pay. Mm -hmm. So um, payment um, has been prorated mm -hmm. based on the number of employees an organization has and also the annual turnover. Okay. So mm -hmm. the minimum fees payable is 4000 mm -hmm. This is upon registration mm -hmm. and the maximum 
income is payable, payable for entities with over um uh, uh, with a turnover of over 50 million mm -hmm. and over 99 employees mm -hmm. is 40,000 okay yeah okay. so and the reason why it has been done like that is just to make sure the cost implication is not seen as a burden mm. to entities that are required to register yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. so depending on your turnover mm -hmm. and also the number of employees you have so the higher your turnover mm. the more you'll be required to pay um the lower your turnover then you end up paying the minimum mm -hmm. yeah, fees at the end of the day. Yeah. So once you provide this information, mm -hmm. um, you'll submit your application. Mm -hmm. On our end as the office, we'll be able to review your application mm -hmm. uh, and verify it based on the information that you have provided. Mm -hmm. If you need to do any amendment, you'll be notified. Mm -hmm. So okay. everything is automated. So okay. you'll get a notification on your email. Your application has been reviewed. Mm -hmm. You need to maybe amend a few aspects of your application. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe like provide additional safeguards that you put in place mm -hmm. to protect the personal data that you're handling. Okay. And then once you amend those um, requirements, mm -hmm. once your application is verified, mm -hmm. you should have your certificate within 14 days. So it's not just... Uh you know, you apply and it's a yes or no, but you actually evaluate and see, you know, where the gaps uh, this organization is having. You go back to the organization and say, can you fix these things? And then Resubmit. review. Yes. Okay. So is it rejected at that point or is it sent back with recommendations and then you come back again and get re-reviewed? It is sent back with recommendations. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then is there uh, any point where it's actually totally rejected? Yeah, there are certain instances where the application may be rejected. Mm -hmm. For example, if you provide false information, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. that in itself is an offense mm -hmm. under the registration regulations. Okay. So automatically your application will have to be rejected. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just on that question about about, you know, registering um, businesses to register as controllers or processors, are there any exemptions, you know, businesses that, you know, don't meet the, meet the threshold to register? Yeah. Um, so there are specific uh, businesses that have been exempted from registration, mm -hmm. and these businesses fall under the categories of what we classify as SMEs. Mm -hmm. So small, medium, and micro enterprises have mm -hmm. been exempted. Mm -hmm. uh, so to find out whether your organization actually qualifies for this specific exemption, mm -hmm. you'll need to look at one, the number of employees that you have, mm -hmm. and also secondly, your annual turnover. Mm -hmm. So if you have, let's say, an annual, so the requirement under the regulations is in organizations that have an annual turnover of less than 5 million mm -hmm. and less than 10 employees have been exempted. So this would apply to your traditional Mama Mboga. Mm -hmm. We do not expect um, Mama Mboga to register yeah. based on her annual turnover. Yeah. However, just because uh, organizations have been exempted from registration mm -hmm. does not mean that they have been exempted from the obligation to actually comply mm -hmm. with the other requirements of the Data Protection Act. Okay. Um, okay. So, yeah. So something to note um, is that um, in as much as the exemption applies to SMEs, mm -hmm. there are specific SMEs that have been required to register mm -hmm. based on the specific sectors that they operate in. Mm -hmm. So, um, for example, organizations that um, are in the gambling business mm -hmm. are expected to register mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're SMEs or not based on the amount of information that they process. Mm -hmm. So this information is available on the website of the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. Yeah. But of the top of my head, some of the organizations that are required to register, mm -hmm. regardless of whether they're SMEs or not, mm -hmm. are uh, organizations that are in the business of um, um, gambling, mm -hmm. organizations for that are in the business of um, political party or representation of the people. Okay. So if you're a political party or if you operate a political party, you're expected to register mm -hmm. based on the information that they handle. Mm -hmm. Organizations um, that are in the health sector mm -hmm. or uh, provision of health care, yeah. both, uh, both at a primary and also a secondary level, mm -hmm. expected to register. Mm -hmm. uh, um, businesses that um, offer educational services mm -hmm. are expected to register. So if you operate a school, you're expected mm -hmm. to register and the reason is... Um, the data subjects that you deal with children mm -hmm. are considered to be vulnerable yeah. individuals. Mm -hmm. So we have, the office has to carry out an assessment of your compliance requirements. Mm -hmm. And also um, the registration um, process will help you ascertain what you need to do to actually ensure that you're compliant with the requirements of the Data Protection Act. Mm -hmm. Other entities are entities that are um, operate or offer CCTV services. Mm -hmm. Entities that process biometric data are also expected to register.
Oh, wow. Yeah. wow, wow. All this information is on the ODPC website. Yes, yes. So on the website, we've um, the office has published a guidance note mm -hmm. that set out organizations that are required to register, mm -hmm. organizations that have been exempted to register, mm -hmm. and also organizations um, that are required to register based on the specific sector that they operate in yes. or based on um, the purpose for which they process mm -hmm. personal data. So for a good, a good example, organizations that are in the business of um, direct marketing, mm -hmm. I'd assume people in the marketing society would fall under that specific category, mm -hmm. actually expected to register. So for them, yeah. even if your business is an SME, mm -hmm. the, uh, the exemption does not apply to you. You'd be expected mm -hmm. to register with the office. Hmm. Okay, just repeat that point again mm -hmm. about the, uh, the ones who are um, processing, doing direct marketing. Yeah. In our SMBs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just repeat that point again. So if you're an SME, mm -hmm. um, the traditional route would be you'd be you have been exempted to, mm -hmm. to register. Mm -hmm. However, if you're an SME that is engaged in direct marketing, mm -hmm. and what we mean by direct marketing is you use personal data to send out marketing communications to individuals at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. If that is your core business function, mm -hmm. then you'd be expected to register mm -hmm. with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. So the exemption does not apply to you you have to register. Mm -hmm. Random question. Mm -hmm. What about like, um, let's say I'm a independent consultant mm -hmm. um, and I'm, one of the things I'm doing is doing a direct marketing campaign on behalf of a client. Do I need to register as an independent consultant or not? That's a, another scenario that could potentially occur in you know the marketing profession. Mm -hmm. So in that capacity, yes, mm -hmm. you would need to register. You remember the categorization we talked about where you're a data controller and you're a data processor. Mm -hmm. So this registration that you'll be effecting mm -hmm. uh, by virtue of you carrying out your direct marketing activity mm -hmm. is you'd be registering as a data processor mm -hmm. and you'd be saying part of what I do is also direct marketing. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of this is that um, the fees has been capped. Mm -hmm. So if you're an SME, mm -hmm. you'll be you'll end up paying the minimum fee, mm -hmm. which is 4000 mm -hmm. in terms of registration. Mm -hmm. So you'd be registering as a data. Sorry. You'd be registering as a data processor mm -hmm. uh, and you'd be saying um, I carry one of the processing activities that you'd be identifying in your registration process mm -hmm. is for purposes of direct marketing. Mm -hmm. The entity that you're working on behalf of, mm -hmm. the, the entity that the data controller mm -hmm. would also be expected to register as well. Mm -hmm. yes. So, you know, the registration, does it apply to businesses that are not domiciled in Kenya? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so how the, 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 um, the Data Protection Act has what we call an extraterritorial application. Mm -hmm. So what this means is that your business doesn't necessarily have to be located in Kenya mm -hmm. for it to apply to you. Mm -hmm. So um, regardless of where your business is located, so long as you're processing personal data mm -hmm. of someone who's located in Kenya, mm -hmm. you're expected to comply. So I could have a company in Uganda mm -hmm. that provides specific services to individuals in Kenya, mm -hmm. but my business is not registered in Kenya, it's mm -hmm. registered in Uganda. Mm -hmm. The virtue, uh, By the virtue of the fact that I am dealing with Kenyan citizens, mm -hmm automatically I have to comply with the requirements mm -hmm. of the Data Protection Act. And that's how most Data Protection Acts are, are structured. Yeah. You'll find that entities um, who operate in Kenya mm -hmm. but deal with citizens from the EU mm -hmm. are required to comply with the GDPR. Mm -hmm. Same way, you'll find entities in the EU that mm -hmm. deal with Kenyan citizens or Kenyan data subjects mm -hmm. are expected to comply with the Data Protection Act in Kenya. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so long as you're dealing so long as any of the people you're dealing with, mm -hmm. any of the data subjects you're dealing with as Kenyan, mm -hmm. then you'd be expected to comply with the D Data Protection Act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where you're located. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And in terms of the registration, it's valid for a period of two years. Um, so what happens after two years and why the two year mm -hmm. um, you know, requirement mm -hmm. or validity of that um, registration? Um, so once you register, you'll be issued with a certificate. Mm -hmm. um, that certificate is valid for a period of two years. So after the two-year period, mm -hmm. you'd be expected to renew your registration mm -hmm. at a cost. Mm -hmm. So the registration cost is um, significantly... Um, so the renewal fee is lower compared to the registration fee. Mm -hmm. So if you ended up paying, let's say, 4000 for registration, when you're renewing your certificate, you'll find that um, the registration fee is 2000 mm -hmm. So, so it depends on the specific category you registered as. Yeah. But the, re um, the renewal fee 
is um lower compared to the initial registration fee. Mm-hmm. Um the duration of 2 years is to give businesses a bit more time. Mm-hmm. Um as opposed to make it, make, making it an annual um renewal fee mm-hmm. more time mm-hmm. means um the cost implication the burden of registration is um significantly reduced on businesses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also the validity of the certificate is that um it does something to for businesses we we consider it um what can i call it 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 sends communication to the bus- to the individuals that you're dealing with at the end of the day mm. um i am compliant with the requirements of the data protection act yeah. so for anybody who engages with your business mm-hmm. there's that aspect of trust that you're able to build yeah. if i go to an institution and i see that this institution has registered with the office of the data protection commissioner mm-hmm. i am comfortable mm-hmm. giving out my information yeah. to this specific organization because mm-hmm. i know off the back of it these people are thinking about my rights mm. they're thinking about how they can protect me as a data subject yeah. and they've also thought through the process of what safeguards they have put in place mm. to make sure that the personal information that they hold is protected mm. and at the point of renewal do uh, data controllers or processors have to do another assessment or is it just an automatic i want to renew it and it's done are there other requirements or you get another review required so how the system has been set up you do not need to provide information afresh mm-hmm. so it allows um the entities the opportunity to actually update any aspect of their processing operations that may have changed mm-hmm. however if nothing has changed mm-hmm. it should be an automatic renewal mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. so there's no need to provide information afresh the okay. information that you had provided for mm-hmm. if it's same if it's still relevant mm-hmm. so you the instances you'll have to add on information mm-hmm. the instances you'll have to reduce information and the instances you you wouldn't need to do any change okay yeah okay. so it's an automatic process okay yeah. um so now that you know we've talked about um data controllers and data processors registering and these are the entities who would be you know having the data and uh, and so on mm-hmm. um as a data subject the person who these entities are holding information about how can i file a complaint to the office of the data protection commission so in terms of filing a complaint Mm, we've also automated that process as well so um the act and the regulations the um, the general reg- the complaints handling and enforcement procedure regulations provide for filing of complaints mm-hmm. so um you 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 can use various methods the responsibility is on the office to make sure that these various methods are available to you mm. so if you're comfortable you can come in and walk to our offices and say you want to file a complaint mm-hmm. uh you'll a specific officer will be assigned to you mm-hmm. and they'll have the responsibility of reducing that complaint and recording it mm-hmm. um alternatively you can make a phone call to the office mm-hmm. um we have a dedicated line mm-hmm. that deals with complaints mm-hmm. and then an officer will be assigned and will take up your complaint mm-hmm. and reduce it down to rating um the other way to go about it is through our website you just log on to our website mm-hmm. www.odpc.go.ke mm-hmm. and then you'll see also a tab that says file a complaint mm-hmm. so you'll be required to provide information mm-hmm. in relation to the organization that you're complaining about mm-hmm. and the specific incident or the specific right that you're complaining about mm-hmm. and then also you'll be required to leave your contact information mm-hmm. for purposes of the investigation officers from the office reaching out to you mm-hmm. in investigating the complaint mm-hmm. yes yeah. yeah so there are various m- modes you could make a phone call you could send an email mm-hmm. you could file your complaint on the website mm-hmm. or if you're comfortable you could just walk into any of the offices that we have yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. Maybe for purposes of clarity, we are located at Britam Towers, Upper Hill, mm-hmm. on 12th and 13th floor. Um, you talked about, um, you know, the rights, you know, someone goes to complain about their right being infringed upon. Um, maybe you can talk about some of the specific rights that are guaranteed in the Data Protection Act. Mm-hmm. Um, so the act gives various rights um, that a data subject is entitled to. Um, the first right is that you have the right to be informed that personal data about you is being collected. Mm-hmm. So in any instances when someone is asking you to give um, them personal information, they should tell you or they should give you a specific reason why they need that personal information. So for example, whenever you're entering any building, mm-hmm. um, there's usually the Ascari. Let me use the Ascari example because it's the most 
relatable mm. one. There's usually an askari mm. who's located at the entrance. Now they'll tell you you need to sign here. You need to give me your name, your ID number, and which specific business entity you're visiting, mm-hmm. or which organization you're visiting in this specific premises. Yeah. So they need to tell you why they need that information because mm-hmm. the information belongs to you at the end of the day. So you should get to know why this information is being required. Mm-hmm. So in terms of how they give you that information, it can vary. Mm-hmm. Most organizations have opted to go um through the data protection policy route, mm-hmm. whereby they publish data protection policies that state mm-hmm. what information um what information they require Mm -hmm. and what that information will be used for. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the rights. So in instances whereby someone fails to comply with your right to uh, to inform you why they need this personal data, mm-hmm. then you can come to the office and also complain. Mm-hmm. The other right that you have is a right to access personal data. Mm-hmm. So this right applies in instances where you want to know what this organization holds about you. Mm-hmm. So you have the right to access that personal data. You have um, the right to write to that organization and tell them to inform you whether they hold any personal information about you. Mm-hmm. If they do, you have a right to get that information. Mm-hmm. So in instances where they fail to comply with that specific obligation, mm-hmm. then you can complain to the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. will also help you enforce that specific right. Mm-hmm. And then there are other rights that accrue from the right to access to information, mm-hmm. like the right to have your information corrected mm-hmm. or deleted in instances where that information is outdated, Mm -hmm. irrelevant, or even excessive. Mm -hmm. There's a right to data portability. This right allows you to move your data from one organization to another. Mm -hmm. There's also the right not to be subjected to automated Mm decision-making. So uh, let's say an organization uses automated means to actually arrive at a specific decision. Mm -hmm. If you feel that you've been disadvantaged as an individual, Mm -hmm. then you have the right to seek a recourse and require a human being Mm -hmm. reviews that decision that was made Mm-hmm. to see whether the same was fair mm-hmm. or not. Yeah. And yeah. then now we have um, a right that is um, relatively new into the ecosystem, mm-hmm. even globally, the right to be forgotten. Mm-hmm. If, okay. if you've noticed of late, most social media accounts mm-hmm. have uh, uh, have adopted that new feature into, into how they operate. Mm-hmm. So you can delete your Facebook account, mm-hmm. you can delete your Google account, mm-hmm. you can delete your Twitter account, mm-hmm. Instagram. Mm-hmm. So it's something that initially wasn't there, mm-hmm. and it's okay. in, it's in it's a, it's a, it's a push to actually comply with the right to be forgotten. Mm-hmm. Yes. So that organization should completely erase everything that they had about you. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. However, let me just say this as a caveat: there mm-hmm. are specific situations where um, this light or these rights may be limited. Mm-hmm. So, for example, mm-hmm. you cannot go to KRA and ask them to forget you. Mm-hmm. KRA has a specific obligation yeah. in terms of collecting taxes. Mm-hmm. And so long as you earn an income and you have the responsibility to pay your taxes, yeah. they will have to hold your personal data. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The same way if you have a criminal record mm-hmm. and um, the DCAI has this information about you, mm-hmm. you see they are complying with a specific mandate that they have been given by the government. Yeah. So they have a responsibility to make sure this information is available mm-hmm. and um, they keep it for a specific duration of time. Mm-hmm. So once that time has lapsed, then they can look into it and see whether they can actually delete mm. um, this information that they hold. So the Data Protection Act doesn't work in a silo. No, 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 it doesn't. Yeah, there are times where it, you know there are certain things need to be referenced in the wider legal framework of the country. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you can share, you know, the example of the right to automated processing that we had talked about earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I found that quite an interesting example, mm-hmm. tangible example mm-hmm. of what that looks like. Yeah. Um, so um, this applies to... Um, it, this was happening, I think it was 2017 going to 2018, uh, when the government had introduced um, the NEMIS system. Mm-hmm. This is a system that was used to assign um, primary living students to specific secondary schools. Mm-hmm. So um, it was automated in the sense that um, the system that had been built um, was relying on specific parameters of information. Mm-hmm. So it would look into where the student had gone to uh, school in terms of primary education, the amount of mas- marks this student had scored, mm-hmm. and also it would look into their names and also their surnames. Mm-hmm. Um, and then y- using that information, it would be able to assign this primary living student to a specific secondary school. Mm-hmm. However, based on our cultural backgrounds, there are certain names that were picked on 
um that are considered to be tradition traditionally female mm-hmm. so for example let's say if you come from central kenya you'll find that there are male students who've adopted their mother's maiden names mm-hmm. as their surnames mm-hmm. so someone would read for example someone's name could be jerry stanley and you'd think that this person is female mm-hmm. so how the system worked was that it was able to pick that individual mm-hmm. and assign them to a sec- uh, an all girls secondary school mm-hmm. and you see the oh. advent of that is that this individual mm-hmm. would not be able to actually attend that specific school yeah. so what happened in that situation is human beings were actually called in to intervene mm-hmm. so you would sit there as Fiona mm-hmm. and actually see oh this specific student is a male student mm-hmm. but they have been assigned to an all female. female secondary school yeah. so erroneously. they uh, erroneously yeah. yeah and they would not be able to attend so you would yeah. sit down review and actually assign them to a specific school mm-hmm. that would they would be able to attend mm-hmm. so that is what the right to the right not to be subjected to decisions made purely by automated means mm-hmm. applies mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. Wow, interesting, interesting. And so parents, you know, appealed and said, this was not right. Can you relook at this? Yes, and yes. And that's how they remedied the situation. Yes, that's how the situation was remedied. Mm. Yeah. And this applies in many instances, especially with the adoption of AI. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe this is something that data controllers and data processors need to consider. Mm-hmm. So, for example, if you're recruiting and you're relying on um, psychometric testing, mm-hmm. you see psychometric testing can be considered to be an automated uh, decision making system Process, yeah so what happens whereby the people who've actually sat down for the specific interview mm-hmm. are dissatisfied with the outcome mm. of the interview mm. then you need to have parameters that will actually allow mm-hmm. for the reissuing of the specific test mm-hmm. using the same conditions mm-hmm. and but I um the monitoring could be done by a human being. Mm-hmm. So if it's you, Fiona, sitting down and actually asking me these questions and mm-hmm. telling me I have maybe, let's say, 90 minutes mm-hmm. to actually answer these questions. Yeah. 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 So that's the intervention of the human being. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. And all these rights are protected in the Data Protection Act. Yes. Yeah. Wow.